Hello, and welcome to This Month on the Railroad, my YouTube series where I recap the big train-related news in North America every month. For the month of August, I've decided to go back to the train-related background footage, and although it isn't freight cars passing by like in the first few episodes, it's gameplay footage from the new Train Sim World 2 Rush Hour DLC. With that out of the way, let's get right into it. On July 30th, the Surface Transportation Board accepted CSX's application for a merger with Pan Am Railways. This doesn't mean that the merger itself has been approved, but that the application documents have been accepted as the past two times CSX submitted its merger applications, the STB described them as being incomplete. STB comments on the merger were due on August 27th but were postponed for unknown reasons. Final briefings will be held on January 2nd, 2022, and if the deal goes through, CSX will take over service on May 1st, 2022. I'll probably make a video talking about the merger and its implications at some time around then once service switches over from Pan Am to CSX. On August 5th, Union Pacific Big Boy No. 4014 began its excursions that would last the entire month of August. As of when this video is being uploaded, the 4014 has one more week remaining before it's back home in Cheyenne, Wyoming. In addition to being one of the biggest locomotives ever built, it's also the first ever steam locomotive equipped with PTC safety systems, which is both cool to see and also very strange. On the 6th, Wabtec celebrated the completion of their 1000th overhauled locomotive over all their plants in North America. This locomotive, Norfolk Southern AC44 C6M number 4463 is that lucky locomotive, and it certainly isn't the last, as Norfolk Southern is rebuilding their entire 1000 plus locomotive fleet of Dash 9s into AC44s. On the 8th, New York and Lake Erie's Alco S1 number 308 entered service after being rebuilt and repainted. The 75 year old Alco will continue to serve into the future, now sporting a fresh coat of Erie paint. On the 9th, Iconic 484, Santa Fe number 3751, completed a minor overhaul program and was fired up for the first time since 2017. This unit subsides in the San Bernardino area just east of Los Angeles, and I'll probably start doing excursions there pretty soon. Between this and last month's news about 2926, this has been a big year for Santa Fe Steam. On the 10th, Brightline announced that they would resume service in Florida for the first time since the beginning of the pandemic. Service should resume in November. Also on the 10th, Canadian Pacific announced that it had rejoined the battle for KCS. Most people thought that CP had given up after CN outbid them, and for a while it was all up to the STB as to whether the acquisition could go through, but now CP is back. This time, their bid is still less than that of Canadian National, but it's more than CP's previous bid. You may be wondering, why would KCS accept this deal? Well, CP is more likely to be accepted by the STB because CN already has a route similar to that of KCS, which creates the possibility of a rail monopoly in that region. Finally, most importantly on the 10th, Congress passed a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. This bill includes $66 billion for Amtrak. This money will allow Amtrak to complete many infrastructure projects across the system, many of which are on the Northeast Corridor. Details as to what specifically the money will spend on are unknown, but much of it is to improve infrastructure that will allow for higher speed service whether that be strengthening and modernizing the tracks on the Northeast Corridor to allow for operations of up to 160 miles per hour, or whether that be eliminating grade crossings on corridor routes to allow for operations of up to 125 miles per hour. Additionally, rumor has it that some of this funding will be used to create new services across the country, many of which were teased in this concept map from a few months ago. The next day, C.P40 number 6711 was spotted on the Amtrak Lakeshore Limited, which was heading east from Albany where it was repaired by Amtrak. Additionally, 6701, the other rebuilt CT Rail P40 in service, was sent to Albany for the same repairs, expected to be on 448 sometime within the next month. A day later, KCS made a statement on Canadian Pacific's new bid from the 10th, stating that the bid was too low for them, thus once again making CN the most likely to take over KCS operations. On the 12th, Amtrak P32 number 708 was spotted leading Amtrak 49 to Chicago. This P32 is the second to last non-rebuilt P32, and it was originally supposed to trail on 49 to Chicago, but somehow it wound up on the head end. After making it to Chicago, it made its way east on the Cardinal to Amtrak's Beach Grove shops where it's being rebuilt. On the 13th, Norfolk Southern announced that they would be reopening their Greencastle, Pennsylvania intermodal terminal after ceasing operations in 2019. It will reopen on September 10th, initially handling traffic to and from Memphis, Tennessee. On the 14th, Amtrak ALC 42 number 300 was seen testing on the Northeast Corridor. This was the first time an ALC 42 would test on an Amtrak line, and testing would continue throughout the month. On the same day, a white jeep drove into a trolley tunnel in Pennsylvania, blocking train traffic for a few hours. I honestly have no clue how that happens, but I suppose that's just everyday shenanigans in Philly. 
On the 15th, the Rocky Mountaineer Scenic Railway ran its first ever excursion out of Denver, Colorado. This new service is a scenic route between Denver, Colorado and Seven Mile, Utah where buses take passengers to Moab. After a night in Moab, the train turns back towards Denver. This train is currently using leased Union Pacific SD-70Ms with Rocky Mountaineer patches on the side. On the same day, a New York subway R143 train was spotted sporting a Supreme wrap. This L-Train R143 has attracted a lot of attention, not only from rail fans, but also from hype beasts and even just from regular people surprised to see a Supreme Subway. I suppose this is a creative way for the MTA to generate some money, as they're pretty much always desperate for more funding. On the 16th, the BNO Railroad Museum in Baltimore, Maryland announced that they had completed their restoration of Central New Jersey Railroad No. 1000, which was the world's first commercial diesel electric locomotive. This historically important locomotive would stay on display in Baltimore until the 31st. This restoration is part of the museum's preparation for the 200th anniversary of American railroading in 2027. On the 17th, the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum received a rare Fairbanks Morse H16-66 locomotive. This engine was originally built in 1958, serving an active freight service until 1997. This weird looking locomotive is one of the last surviving ones in existence, and it'll be able to live much longer in Chattanooga. The next day, the Chesapeake and Indiana Railroad announced that they would be donating X, E, J, and E, SD9 number 818 to the Hoosier Valley Railroad Museum. This will be the museum's first six axle unit. On the 19th, Brightline announced that they were 60% done with their Orlando expansion. At this rate, they'll be done in about a year, which isn't too bad considering that Brightline hasn't been running any trains for almost a year due to COVID. On the 20th, MBTA CRRC Orange Line cars re-entered service after a series of derailments earlier this year. This means that hopefully production will start back up again and more new cars will be delivered, in addition to the CRRC Redline cars that are on order. On the 24th, an Amtrak Extra ran from Albany to Elmira Heights, New York, to the calf plant to pick up the final two cars in the Viewliner 2 order from over 10 years ago. In addition to this extra just being pretty important in terms of the modernization of the railroad, it also had a duo of Amtrak 50th Anniversary units, which I just so happened to see the other day on the Lakeshore Limited. On the 27th, CSX SD70 Max number 4532 and 4535 were released from the Huntington, West Virginia shops. This on its own is a pretty unremarkable story, but these locomotives were repainted into YN3 paint as opposed to YN3B paint like the previous ones are. It was confirmed that from now on, CSX will be transitioning back from their boxcar logo back to their regular logo. In my opinion, it looks much better. Just imagine a tier 4 SD70 Ace in the non-boxcar logo scheme. On the same day, Wabtec battery-powered locomotive number 3000 and recently repainted Jeevo number 2044 were seen making their way east to Pittsburgh for a Freight 2030 event on September 10th. I'd imagine this might get the attention of Norfolk Southern and CSX, two railroads in Pittsburgh, and I wouldn't be surprised to see these railroads testing the new battery-powered locomotive, much like BNSF did earlier this year. And with that, we're at the end of the month, and I'd just like to thank you all for watching my videos. The video I uploaded a few weeks before this one is already my most viewed video, and I can't wait to see what I can do with that audience. There's a bunch of stuff in the works, including a follow-up video to that one, and videos from my recent trips to Pennsylvania and Chicago. With that said, as I'm uploading this, it's also the end of my summer break, which means that school will have to take priority over my videos once again. So don't be surprised if videos become a little more scarce. So yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again in another video.